This is the lecture for ancient and medieval history for Tuesday, the 27th of April, 2021. Um, we had talked about the various national tribal regions, and we're going to come back to what those regions mean in a little bit. Bless you. Bless you. But before we do that, we're going to talk about what holds these regions together, and that is the Christian church. And I'm going to remind you that the Pope is, becomes the chief figure in the Roman Catholic Church, or the Western Christian Church. Now, there are uh, Celtic Christians up here that have nothing to do, bless you. bless you, with the Western Christian Church. Tissues over there. And there are also still Aryan Christians up here that have uh, little to do with what Rome says. But, uh, and there are Muslims in Spain and North Africa, and there are Eastern Orthodox Christians uh, in South Italy, Sicily, and uh, Eastern Europe, all of which don't really care much what the Pope says. But in the West, the Pope is a more and more important figure as time goes on, because the Church is the only organization that still has people who can read and write the count. And <clears throat> today... Let's say you're really good at baking. So you're going to bake a new kind of cinnamon bun. And this cinnamon bun is going to take the world by storm. If you're going to start a business, a cinnabun business, for example, what you are going to need to do is hire two types of people that you might not otherwise think have anything to do with making cinnamon buns. You would have to hire an accountant or three and a lawyer or three because the business side, just close up your, your book and uh, do your best and turn it into the shelf here. The business side involves managing money, paying taxes, paying benefits, paying real estate costs, power bills, and that's where the accountant comes in. Why? Because they're the experts at the paperwork side of money. And you need to hire at least one, probably several lawyers. And the lawyers are there to make sure that your policies are in, con in concordance with the law and that you are therefore not going to get sued for doing things that are a violation of regulations of some kind. These days, you probably also want to hire a human resources specialist to make sure that you are covered when it comes to making sure that you're not engaged in any kind of discriminatory practice. None of this has anything to do with cinnamon buns, None of this has anything to do with setting up Cinnabon uh, franchises around the country. I believe there's a Cinnabon at the Spokane Valley Mall, at least there was. And if you've never had the Cinnabons from Cinnabon, they're, they're pretty good if you like that sort of thing. Of course, I could just be speaking about something that you've never tried because it's beneath you. Oh, Cinnamon Buns from Cinnabon. How plebeian. How, how beneath me. But I'm telling you, if you're at the mall and you want something sweet, they're not bad. You may want to split them between a few people. because You're going to have to spend a lot of money on things that have nothing to do with making and selling cinnamon buns. In the Middle Ages, the uh, biker chieftains, the barbarian chieftains who ruled over regions, came to realize that they needed people who could read, write, and count, that it would help them run things better. So they uh, began working with the church. They may have been Aryan Christians. The church was Catholic Christians. <clears throat> but since the church were the only people that could supp supply literate folk who could keep records, numerate folk who could make sure that the figures added up, and who could make sure that also you could communicate over a long distance Soon the church may, became indispensable to the governance of these barbarian territories in Western Europe. 
and the church was a hierarchy. Still is. <coughs> Excuse me. Dry throat. With the Pope as the overall ruler. I told you about Pope Leo facing off against Attila the Hun in a negotiation and winning. I told you about how Pope Gregory, Pope Gregory the Great called himself the servant of the servants of Christ. I'm going to later cl in class today play for you the kind of music, the first kind of music that we in the West know about, the Gregorian chant, a uh, voice of unaccompanied song euphonous and collective. But before we do that, we're going to talk about the law. The law. The tribal law. If you're a Frank, a Burgundian, a Lombard, a Visigoth, a Vandal, you have rights. And those rights are guaranteed under the law. If you're not wearing a tartar outer garment, please take it off. The law. Not that I'm talking about anyone in particular. <clears throat> I am. Um, in fact, not sure about yours. I think yours is close enough to call good. I think it is. Unless it says something really different in the back, like Edith Joe's or something, does it? Yeah. Yeah, good. Keep it on. I don't think for a moment you'd have something that says something as simple as either Joe's. It would be far more complex and subtle. The idea is that if you are born a member of the tribe, you have certain rights under tribal law. If you're accused of a crime, like uh, theft or killing someone, I'm not saying exactly murder, Depends on the circumstances. It might be manslaughter, it might be murder. Under Frankish law, you have certain rights. Under uh, Visigoth law, you have different rights. Under Burgundian law and Lombard law, Anglo-Saxon law, different, different, different. Each tribe has its own way of doing things, but you have a right to those things. You're, you have that right by being born a Frank or one of these others. you got to understand how important this is. Remember, the Germans did not think of themselves as slaves to their king. They thought of themselves as free men who willingly serve a king that guarantees what? Their rights. So these rights are really important. Now, what I'm about to say is only indicated up here by two little words, tribal law. But I want to explain to you how it is a key building block in our freedom. Let's say you are a Frank. Why not? Hot dog. You're a Frank. It's a dad joke. I expect you to groan, not laugh. I know. I still get it. Yeah, that's fine. Um, and you are going to go to the land of the Visigoths in Spain before the Ma Muslims come. And, oh, well, let's say you're selling uh, golden cloak clasps. Or, or silver cloak clasps, or bejeweled cloak clasps, which was a luxury item. Because everyone in those days wore cloaks, and what you need is a big pin. And if you're wealthy, that big pin can be made of a precious metal, have gems on it, have a symbol on it. It can be the men dressed up with jewelry, just as the women did in those days. So, okay, you're a Frank as a part of a, mer mer a merchant party that is going into the Visigothic lands. And you separate from the rest of your party, and you go to this mountain town. And in the mountain town, you set, settle down for trading for a week. You're going to be there for a week. That'll give you time to advertise and to bring people in, to make a few contacts. But while you're there, a man is killed. And it's a mystery who killed him. And why? Human nature being what it is, what problem are you likely to face if a person just happens to die? All right. When you, does your order look Right. We're kind of xenophobic as a species. We like us. We don't trust them whoever they are. I am an Auslander, an outlander. 
And as an outlander, you don't know me. And if it wasn't me that killed your neighbor, it was one of you. And that's a problem. Because you all know each other. It's like that old horrible country song. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody calls your friend. Uh, Alan Jackson song. We're from the country and we like it that way. Which is like a spike driven through my skull. If it's not me, it's one of you. So it's much easier to assume that the foreigner did it, the Frank did it. Well, here's one of the great things about the barbarians. You don't judge me on Visigothic terms. You don't convene a Visigoth-style court. I'm not a Visigoth. I am not entitled to the rights of a Visigoth. I am entitled to the rights of a Frank. So you have got to discommode yourself to find a number of Franks or somebody competent in Frankish law to make sure that during the trial my rights are guaranteed. I do not give up my rights as a Frank when I leave the land of the Franks and enter the land of the Visigoths. I keep them. They are, you're going to love this word, an alienable. Alien means to separate. An alien is an outsider. And a space alien is from another world. Inalienable is a word that means you can't take it from someone righteously unless certain things happen. That's why John Locke and Thomas Jefferson both wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created, created equal and possessed certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and property, or what Jefferson says, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are God-given inalienable rights. A Frank has rights that you can't separate. So maybe I'm judged under Frankish law and found guilty because you don't want to admit that one of you people are a murderer. Or maybe I'm found innocent, in which case you're back to square one. Either way, you don't railroad me. You've got to give me my due, and my due is my rights. How does this affect us today? Because we don't give up our rights when we travel. Our rights stay with us. We don't lose our rights when we go to another country. Now, it is true that if you go to a communist police state like China and you're accused of a crime, you're going to get thrown in jail and you're going to be judged in a Chinese court because the Chinese are not a part of this whole thing. But normally, say you go to France or Germany or England and you're accused of a crime, you're going to be judged under their law. But the American diplomats at the American embassy are going to make sure that you are not being mistreated, that you are being treated lawfully, that your rights are being protected. What this means is our rights are portable. They go with us. We don't strip them off when we leave home. That means that there is something about being human that gives us these rights. And you can't take them away without due process of law, without a certain set of circumstances happening. Without this principle, you don't have America. Because one of the core values in the United States of America, in the American Republic, is the intrinsic dignity of every human life. You cannot play games with that without risking everyone's freedom. You cannot take rights away from some without imperiling the rights of others. This is one of the reasons why slavery was so odious and obnoxious and incompatible with what had been set up as the American Constitution. Because slavery permanently strips certain people of rights that they should have just by being human. 
I would consider it part of America's success story. When we start as a republic, only propertied white men of European descent are fully enfranchised, have the right to vote. And I mean you need a certain amount of property. Now, the Romans did it that way too. But look at us now. Anyone who's not a felon over the age of 18 in most states can vote. Anyone. Men, women, mentally handicapped people vote. Anyone can vote unless they're a felon in certain states. In other states, <clears throat> you can guess what political party runs them. Um, in other states, people who have been felons but have served their time can vote. And there are people in certain states that are trying to get people who are still in prison, currently serving sentences for violating the rights of others to be able to vote while in prison, which is a shocking notion, traditionally. That's how far we've gone. Anyone over the age of 18. That's a success. In just 200 and what, 30, 40 years, we have expanded the definition to include almost everyone over a certain age. Why? Because you don't want children voting. You figure that one out. Really, think about it. And if you have a problem with not letting children vote, develop an argument. See how far you go. Why not? It'll be fun. I'll count it as extra credit. If you really do a hard job of it, you make a good effort, why not? So, the law, your rights travel with you. Now, what eventually begins to settle out in Europe is there are three classes of people. The French call them estates, and I'll use that term for now. These are just three generic types of people that you're going to find in every town or village. The first are the clergy, and the clergy are your priests, your monks, your nuns, your bishops, your cardinals, the pope. Anyone who is a churchman. Now, it does not include elders. Elders are Christian believers that take part in church activities, but they're not men of the cloth. They haven't taken holy vows. They're not nuns. They haven't taken holy vows. If you have taken holy vows, you are a member of the clergy. And as medieval law develops, the clergy have certain rights. For example, only the church can judge clergymen. This has changed. But back in the day, if you lived in France or England or Spain or Italy, and you were a nun or a monk or a priest, and you were accused of a crime, you would not be tried in a civil court. You would not be tried in the king's court. You would be tried in a church court. That doesn't guarantee that you're going to get off. It guarantees that you possess the rights of a clergyman. And those rights will not be stepped on. The second estate is the nobility. The nobility are the upper class. The king, actually, eventually the emperor, the kings, the grand dukes, the dukes, the uh, marquis and counts, the barons, the knights, anyone with a title, lord, sir, duke, prince, king. And to be a member of the nobility, most of the time you have to be born into it. You can't just decide, today I'm going to be a noble. You can call me Lord Fancy Pants. No. The medieval society did not guarantee you the right to be identified as you choose. If you identify as Lord Fancy Pants, you're going to go to the fields and dig turnips all day because you're a peasant and there you are. And if you keep talking about Lord Fancy Pants, maybe you'll become a court jester or live like a fool. Or maybe you'll just get locked up or uh, sent away or even killed if you're a constant ongoing problem. You've got to be born into the nobility, with this exception. If you do a really, 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 exceptionally, unusually, really, 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 really special thing, like save the life of your king on a battlefield, or invent something that makes the kingdom much stronger, or something else that's just really, really, unusually special, you might, and I say the word might, get rewarded with a knighthood. 
And that means your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren might inherit that title. And they might rise up generation by generation in the nobility. That's possible, but it's really uncommon. For the most part, the ruling class are descended from the Germans that took over, and the underclass, the peasant class, the third class we're going to talk about, are descendants of the Romans. And that only changes little in the next thousand years. There's very little shifting between uh, the commoners and the nobility. Clergy is a different story. You can be poor and become a priest or a monk or a nun. It's not easy, but you can't. If you're rich and you become a priest or a monk or a nun, you're going to be upper clergy. You're going to be senior. You're going to be leading. Third estate is commoners. Commoners include people who live in towns who are outside of the system. Because in towns, the few that exist, you're judged on what you do, not who your father was. But everywhere else, you're judged by who your father was. Remember, you are what your daddy does. It's one of the basic rules of the Middle Ages. You are what your daddy does, and God and his church are at the center of all things. Those are the two basic rules of medieval life. So if your daddy was a turnip farmer, then you're a turnip farmer. In the countryside, most people are born into a status that's not free. Peasants, for example, are able to make money, but they have to stay on the land and obey their lord. If they don't, then, well, they're criminals. Serfs are slaves. The only difference between serfs and slaves is that serfs can't be sold away from the land. When you buy a piece of land, you buy the serfs on it. Like today, if you buy a piece of land, if there's a rock or a tree or a brook on it, you get to have those. The serfs come with the territory. Slaves are as ever miserable human tools who are bought and sold uh, the way we buy and sell appliances or you know, garden tools. So those are the three classes that are developing during this Dark Age period. The rules are not fully enforced yet, but this is the way most people are going to live their lives. Most are commoners, peasants, serfs, or slaves, or towns, a fewer townsmen, and even fewer are nobles or clergy. Questions, comments, thoughts? Okay. Then what I'm going to do... Mr. Jinori? Yes. He has a question. Oh, sorry. What about me? So, like, if your dad's a farmer or, like, someone, oh. but you're a woman... A woman's status is always determined by her father, then her husband or brother, then her son. The identity is almost never independent. Now, there were a few queens that we'll talk about, like Eleanor of Aquitaine, who's queen of both parts of France and England, and she was allowed to be an individual, but she was also the wife of two powerful kings, King of France and then the King of England. A woman's status, like a man's status, is derived from birth, from the father. If she marries, and it's usually when, her husband's status is what she takes on. She becomes an extension of him. If her husband dies, but she's still alive, and her son is there, her son's status becomes hers. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play, uh, and I'll, I'll stop the video for this and put links on, uh, some music with a Dark Age feel. And this is to lead us to uh, Gregorian chants, which we may get to today or tomorrow. So, see you at home.